Hello, everybody. How are you doing today? My name is Jeff Greenswag. Thank you very much for joining me on the webinar. I really appreciate it. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Um, just kind of testing it out. I know you guys can type and not necessarily talk. Um, <clears throat> and what we're going to do um, is I'm going to go through the entire presentation and then, uh, okay, great, glad you can hear me. I'm gonna go through the entire presentation and then uh, we're gonna have a little Q&A at the end. I'll stick around, I'll hang out, I'll answer everyone's questions and stuff like that. So um, without further ado, I am going to get us started here. All right, everybody, so the title of this program is From Connoisseur to Sommelier, uh, Taking Your Cannabis Knowledge to the Next Level with Cannabis Interpreting. And really, uh, the sommelier word is meant for wine. And we say sommelier because it's easy to identify with, but an interpreter is much more than that. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that in this presentation, as well as how to do a little bit of interpreting with bud structure, which is just one of many, many different factors that we look at uh, when dealing with cannabis identification. And uh, if you want to come out to the classes uh, coming up, it, either uh, December 1st, 2nd, and 3rd in Michigan, or coming up mid-December here in Chicago, um, we'll be able to get you taken care of. Um, but let's start out with, you know, talking about what is interpreting. Well, first of all, you know, it's interpreting. It's a combination of the words interpret and terpenes. And for those of you who know what terpenes are, um, congratulations. That's a good piece of information to have. For those of you who don't know what terpenes are, uh, those are the chemical building blocks of scent. And uh, by interpreting those scent profiles, uh, along with some other factors of cannabis, um, we are able to discern what that cannabis is going to do when you consume it. We're going to be able to tell you how good it is, whether or not it's safe to consume, and things of that nature. So why don't we take a look at interpreting uh, with bud structure. So like we said, sommeliers, you know, it's something that a lot of people know about. Uh, these are trained and knowledgeable wine professionals. They specialize in all aspects of wine service. Um, you know, they can swish a glass of wine around, take a sniff, smell it, drink it, uh, swish it around in their mouth, spit it out, and uh, they can tell a whole story about that, a lot of the best ones. You know, they can tell you where on earth that wine was from and, and whether or not it was a good harvest that year and if it was a good producer and, and maybe even the exact name of the producer if they're really well versed. Um, and now that can actually be done with cannabis as well. It's a little more difficult, obviously, because we don't necessarily grow in the ground everywhere. Um, so terroir is not necessarily a thing. Um, but that's why we have interpreting. It's the art of the cannabis sommelier. It's using sight and scent to gauge cannabis safety, quality, and indica sativa ratio in order to predict the psychotropic effects before consumption. And this is a really important skill, especially if uh, you don't want to rely on you know, the madness that is strain names, and we'll cover that in a little bit. But I wanted to give you guys a little bit of my background and tell you kind of where I got to this position um, and being able to give you this information. So uh, I started consuming cannabis when I was 13 years old, a uh, lifelong consumer every day. High Times Magazine centerfolds on my wall from age 14 or so on. And uh, it's just always been a part of my life. I grew it a little, you know, I always played around with it. And like a lot of people, uh, I had to take care of my friends and make sure that they were okay and learning cannabis and those kinds of things because I was the guy who, who knew about it, right? And so I guess this is just a natural outgrowth of that. But uh, in, after college, I moved to Denver uh, and I went to law school and, you know, being a lawyer didn't really agree with me. And ultimately, I got into the cannabis industry by starting a strain menu website for dispensaries uh, in 2008. Um, little did I know Weed Maps and Leafly were around the corner. So while that didn't pan out as a business model, I made a lot of friends and, and uh, ended up working in the Colorado cannabis industry for several years, uh, ultimately working with the Tricome Institute 
after I became a level two interpreter by passing their exam. And, and uh, I got a chance to move out here to Chicago and work for some dispensary out here. And now I'm doing some cannabis education on my own. And I'm lucky enough to be licensed with the Tricom Institute's interpreting program. And I'm, I'm happy to be bringing the level one program to all of you. So um, when you do this, and, and here I am, of course, you know, seeing and smelling some more cannabis, you can uh, come across a lot of really, really fun opportunities. Um, this program also had a little baby uh, while I was working at the Tricom Institute, and I helped develop the Tricom Assurance Grading Program, uh, which is basically the wine spectator scoring system of cannabis, where we teach people how to look at cannabis all through the same lens and grade cannabis on uh, many, many factors, uh, all out of 100 points. And we give uh, the opportunity to um, grade at a very high, highly consistent and accurate level, uh, the Dope Cup. Um, so if you know who Dope Magazine is, um, this is a little grading session that I was doing for Dope. Uh, one night where I was having to smoke all of these different kinds of cannabis. And as you can see, you know, the bags would disappear. I'd pack them up. I'm stacking up the pipes over there, smoking them and writing down my notes and, and then a whole lot of data entry. So it's not without its work. Um, but uh, going further with this program and uh, can really uh, bring along some really cool things with cannabis, especially the, as the industry grows, we're going to need a lot more people who know what they're doing. Uh, and just like with beer and cheese and coffee, we've got the Cicerones and Mongers and Cuppers. Um, you know, all of these things are about the enjoyment of what they're uh, consuming. And <clears throat> with cannabis, not only is it about the enjoyment of it, but it's also about the safety. It's also about the medicinal effect that we're expecting. And uh, that's why I think that there's no other skill set that's as important to its product as interpreting is to cannabis. <clears throat> So the real problem um, and what interpreting aims to solve is, you know, how do we know that this is purple dream, right? How do we know that that's purple dream? Is it possible to know that this is purple dream? Um, so unfortunately, um, it's very difficult to know. And that's what we like to call the strain name dilemma. Um, so what the strain name dilemma is, is kind of a look back at the black market, right? there were decades and decades where this plant was forced to be cultivated underground and people were very secretive about what they were doing. You know, farmers didn't want to share their genetics. Um, things were stolen, things were counterfeited. And that unfortunately resulted in a lot of distinct yet unknown cannabis genetics. Um, when these growers were, transferring their skill set and their plants over to the legal cannabis industry. Unfortunately, a lot of this followed. And it, it wasn't until recently um, that we've had some uh, opportunities to solve these issues. Um, but there's uh, additional complications besides just the fact that this was an underground industry for so long. Um, additional in issues include cannabis morphology, counterfeiting, and the law. And uh, cannabis morphology is basically uh, kind of understanding that cannabis is a really, really adaptable plant. And uh, the way a lot of people grow is by cloning a plant, and that's by taking a cutting from it in a certain way. And then you can develop roots out of that and create your own plant from that. And it'll be genetically identical to the plant you took it from. Now, the issue is if it's the original plant was grown, say, in Southern California, in the hot sun, in the dirt, in the ground, and uh, open to Mother Nature. Um, and then it was taken and cloned and transplanted up to the Northeast and grown in a warehouse um, with really cold water under artificial lighting. I mean, it might not be this drastic of a difference, um, but the plant will express itself differently. It'll look different. It'll have different chemicals because it'll have different scents and, um, you know, therefore it'll have different effects. And so it'll be a different phenotype of that plant and that's okay. But if you're going to call it the same thing, you know, we have to have a way to track this and understand this so that people know that it's not going to be the same experience they had if they had that same plant in Southern California and are now accessing it in the Northeast. Additionally, counterfeiting is a huge issue. 
Um, you see some ladies here enjoying uh, grabbing some handbags. And, and uh, if you've ever walked around a major city, um, you know that there are people selling counterfeit goods all over the place. You got, you know, Folex watches and Fuji purses and all these other things. And, you know, with fashion, it's a $461 billion a year industry. And if you think that that didn't have an influence on the cannabis industry, um, I would venture to guess that you were incorrect because there were probably times when somebody was having trouble selling a certain product. Um, and so they decided to just change the name of it to say blue dream, which was really popular for a long time and would get sold much easier and maybe at a lower price, but it would get sold because it's blue dream and people want to be able to sell blue dream. And then let's say there's a seed in there and somebody finds it and they grow it. And because they thought it was blue dream, they call it blue dream. And now they're selling that and you can see how it spreads. So, um, counterfeiting is definitely an issue in the cannabis industry. And, um, fortunately, like I said, there's some people doing some things to take care of this. So, uh, one method is, uh, you know, certain businesses and certain cultivators are applying for legal protection for their genetics. They are actually getting DNA testing done on their cannabis and registering it as a unique product. Um, and, uh, you know, that type of genetic testing is also done by Phylos Bioscience. I highly, highly recommend everybody go to Phylos Bioscience um, on Google. I think it's even just phylosbioscience.com. Um, but uh, they have a universe of cannabis. And what they're doing is they're genetically testing all the cannabis and they're putting it on a map uh, that is three dimensional, like outer space. And um, the closer, you know, two samples are to each other, the more genetically identical they are. So if they're right on top of each other, but they're called different things, you know, that's an issue where people had a strain that they thought was something else, but it was in fact genetically identical to this other strain. Um, and we'll take a look at the Phylos Galaxy in a minute. I got a really cool like four, four or five minute video coming up. Um, but if, you know, we don't have access to this genetic testing, if we have to be shopping on the black market or we're in a dispensary and they don't access this technology because it's expensive or not available in their location, you know, um, we have to rely on our cultivators. Um, so if you find that you like a certain strain name from a certain cultivator um, and you buy it and you enjoy it, and that's great. Um, now, if you want to get that same experience, you need to find that cultivator's version of that strain again. It doesn't matter what dispensary it's in, as so long as it's from that same original cultivator. Um, now, some dispensaries feature the cultivator's name, some don't. Um, it depends on the market you're in. Um, and the only real way to know um, is to have uh, some interpreting skills. And by being able to see and smell the cannabis and tell for yourself what this cannabis is going to do to you when you consume it, um, you're going to be able to keep yourself safe and happy with your cannabis consumption decisions. So here's a video from Phylos Bioscience that I'd like us all to take a look at real quick. So if you go online, it's just this three-dimensional map. You can zoom around in it. You can play with it. You can search for things. and now different growers and different dispensaries have their own constellations in there. Some dispensaries are finally starting to send letters to their suppliers saying, if you want to have stuff in our store, you have to get it tested because we want our patients to know what they're getting. So th the idea was kind of that we would be able to build this huge data set and answer some really difficult questions if we could solve a market problem, if we could create a demand for consistency or meet the demand for consistency. And it's working. People are sending us tons of samples. Those samples aren't the rare, interesting ones. They're the industry samples. And so we're trying to tease apart all that mess. And the bigger the data set gets, the more we can tell people with certainty what they really have. These are just the names that everything came in with. We can see that at least 30% of the names are wrong or nonsensical. But people are already starting to log on and change the names. People send us samples of different things often, and we find out that actually they have the same thing. People are using it to settle disputes even. 
which I'm not sure how I feel about, but you can definitely do kind of a, you know, like a DNA paternity test and figure out, you know, if your buddy really took a cutting from you and is selling it in Washington State or not, you can figure that out. So, one problem with this data inherently is that it's just complicated data. So if you zoom in on certain parts of the galaxy and you turn on all the relationship lines, you, you can't even see some of the names. Like it's so dense. Like this is, so this is the actual data. The dots are separated by genetic distance. The lines are first degree relationships, either parent-child or sibling-sibling. And there's so many varieties that it's such a tangle. And the reason for that is that there's no such thing as a strain. So people talk about seed lines and clonal lines. And there are clonal varieties. If you have a plant that's good and you take cuttings from it, all of those cuttings will be genetically identical. That's a variety. But in normal agriculture, people have made genetically stable plants. And all our children are the same. No one's ever done that for cannabis. So when you cross a male and a female cannabis plant, the seeds that you get are unique individuals, just like all of us. They are as different from each other as you are from your siblings. So all of these dots are individuals. They're not strains. It's just one plant. It's genetically So every plant is its own special snowflake with its own crazy chemical diversity. So it's just a really, really complicated data problem. So here in Israel, as we learned in the last couple of days, they have this weird insistence on doing things correctly. And so they actually are doing experiments to figure out what's in the plant and how does it work. We can't do that in the United States because research is still basically illegal. So what we're doing is collecting tons and tons of data. We're comparing it with patient data and chemical data. There's this massive nationwide experiment going on and hundreds of thousands of people are using this plant. So ultimately, we're going to be able to not just figure out what are you smoking, but we're going to be able to figure out what genes control what traits. And ultimately, we're going to be able to figure out what genes and traits are related to what patient outcomes by mining all that data. And that's it. I have a little bit of an issue with uh, some of my equipment here, um, but I'm going to uh, continue on. Um, but real quick, just log off of sharing this and make sure that nothing's going down in the chat or anything here. Let's see. Oh, you guys couldn't hear the video on that. On, you couldn't hear that video. Okay. So sorry if you couldn't hear that video. Um, it's a pretty cool little thing. It's uh, from Canatech. Um, and basically what that guy is talking about is that um, the data is really, really densely tangled. There's relationships between all these cannabis plants, but there's no such thing as like clear lines. Um, so go on to Phylos Bioscience and check that out. And um, we will... Um, make sure you guys uh, understand what's going on. Um, so back to the slideshow here real quick. All right, so um, let's take a look at interpreting um, with bud structure. Uh, the plant basics, all right? So the leaf structure uh, is a result of the growing environment as well as the plant structure. And nodal spacing um, is the result of the plant structure and bud structure is a result of the nodal spacing. And, and we're going to talk about how all that works here uh, with some little examples. So um, it's kind of important to understand where cannabis comes from, right? So Ruderalis is kind of the redheaded stepchild of the cannabis industry. We don't really talk about that very much. Um, and it comes from way, way up north, uh, near the Arctic Circle even, where there's really weird photo periods and it, and it it's a plant that has a very special characteristic and it does something called auto flowering where it, uh, it makes sure to flower despite not having the conditions of flowering needed. And those conditions are having less than 12 hours of light a day. 
um, unfortunately up that far, uh, the time period where it's less than 12 hours of light a day is so short that a plant wouldn't be able to flower successfully. So, um, you know, it has genetically modified itself to be able to flower despite that. Um, additionally, we've got sativa plants and uh, those are the ones that get us really uplifted and we've got our indica plants and those are the ones that get us really sedated. And as you can see, um, the sativa plants are coming from kind of more arid places and the indica plants are going to be coming from some real jungle type places. And um, when we look at the plants up close, you know, we can tell that the indica plants have the really broad fat leaves and the sativa plants have really thin, thin leaves and the indica plants on the right there are really bushy and short while the sativa plants are nice and tall and lanky and um, there's just a lot more spacing and room to breathe. And, and the reason for that is because, you know, an indica plant, you know, is, is amongst a whole lot of other plants and it's competing for light with um, the canopy of trees above it. And uh, it needed to have really broad leaves to catch as much light and do as much photosynthesis as it could. You know, conversely, sativa plants that are gonna be grown in more arid open conditions. Um, originally, you know, these are the original genetic lines we're talking about, guys. Um, these plants, you know, they didn't need uh, to catch as much light because they had full exposure. So they, they had thinner leaves and kind of protected them from getting too much radiation. Um, and, you know, because of those same conditions, uh, the plants either grew and had space to breathe, like on the right with the uh, sativa plants, or on the left there, the nodal spacing with the indica plants is really short. And um, as a result, you know, those nodal spaces are where the buds grow. And, and so the ones that have more space uh, allow the plant to grow bigger, fluffier, more open buds. And the ones with less space, the indica plants, are dense and round and tight. And that is obvious when you look at uh, the plants that they come from. Um, and so some examples for you, and I'm going to kind of take you through the indica, indica dominant, hybrid, sativa dominant, sativa spectrum here, and we'll kind of flip through them several times so you guys can see the examples. But this is a really classic dense round indica bud. You know, as we get to the indica dominant buds, it's still really densely packed, but it's starting to open up more. The hybrid bud, you can see it's opening up a little, little more even. You can see through the bud in certain places, it's turning more conical. Sativa dominant, definitely more open, definitely more conical, more pointing, more reaching. And then finally the open sativa, you can see how open and reaching and how, how many gaps there are and how wide open and wispy and light that bud is. And so, um, you know, I just want to kind of flip through those again for you guys a few times so you can see it gets opener, more open and fluffier and wider spaced. And um, it's really important to be able to discern what you're looking at so that you can tell how it's going to affect you because it's very, very unlikely that a bud that looks like this, it's open and fluffy, um, is going to make you really sleepy unless, of course, it's old. This is a, This is for really fresh buds this is for good bud guys so um you know if you have a bud that's really super dense and round chances are when you consume that it's going to make you pretty sleepy you're going to be into couch as we like to say with the indicas um so keep that in mind as you're consuming your cannabis uh, one more time for you guys just flip through it indica dominant hybrid sativa dominant sativa all right, and in, in addition to, you know, the indica sativa ratio, interpreting and using bud structure in particular can also be used to determine key elements of cannabis quality. And, um, you know, one of the other things we're going to do is teach you guys how to smell if you come to the class. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to have cannabis on site, but uh, we will have some really fun terpenes and uh, other things to smell to uh, teach you guys these techniques. Um, but getting back to bud structure, um, you know, can also be used to determine the key elements of the cannabis quality. So malformed cannabis is a sign of stress in the growing process, right? Um, stresses can include, you know, interruptions in the lighting cycle, uh, the wrong lighting cycle, uh, issues with temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide levels, uh, the nutrients, the soil mix, insects, disease, and more. Um, and all of these things can place a lot of stress on the bud uh, and it can and it can cause some really nasty issues that are going to make the bud uh, less medicinally effective, uh, more harsh to consume and overall not as good of a product. 
Um, and faulty bud structure is really the way this manifests itself. So on the right there, you know, a little bit more of a mild example of faulty bud structure, but you can see how, you know, the bud kind of like started coning and then it decided to blow up again and stack in really weird patterns and, and not in a way that you would expect. Um, and on the left there, uh, you know, that at one point was a whole bud, uh, but as it dried out and was cured, it couldn't even hold on to itself because it was just constructed so poorly and it just fell apart. So um, these are definitely things to look out for if it's not looking like really nice, nicely shaped buds, um, you know, depending on which uh, variety type you're getting, uh, there's probably something wrong with it and you should probably stay away from it. Um, so if you do guys want to come out to class, we'd love to have you. Um, we're going to learn a whole lot of different things in level one interpreting. Uh, we're going to talk about the strain name dilemma in a little more detail. We're going to talk about cannabis plant basics in a little more detail. We're going to talk all about the genetics of cannabis, uh, what the reality is of the cannabis we're consuming. We're going to talk about the unacceptable visual and odor characteristics and how to observe quality and gauge indica sativa ratio based on cannabis aroma. Uh, we'll talk about trichome density and ripeness and, uh, go over the interpreting methodology for you. And, and this level one is a prerequisite if you want to go to Colorado and do level two. And level two is a really fun class where um, ultimately after looking at over 100 jars of cannabis, you're given a test with 10 jars of cannabis and you have to pick out the five good ones, the five bad ones. The five bad ones, you got to tell them what's wrong about it. And the five good ones, you got to tell them whether it's indica, indica dominant, hybrid, sativa dominant, or sativa. And it's just a great test. Um, now, if you guys do want to come to one of those classes, um, and these are the upcoming classes you can choose from, I've got 10% off for you. So uh, definitely take this code down. You can use it anytime up until the class. You can share it with friends, whatever's clever. It's webinar 10. Um, and I've got, you know, December 1st in Ypsilanti, December 2nd in Lansing, December 3rd uh, in Grand Rapids, and then uh, the rest of the month in December, I'll be back in Illinois. Um, so if you're interested in those things, guys, head over to cannabiseducation.co slash enroll. There's only 30 seats uh, per event, and we are going to probably sell them out, so make sure you get on there. Um, and if you're interested in either sponsoring or hosting a class of your own, um, feel free to contact me or Jamie. And, um, you know, at this time, I am going to uh, stop sharing the uh, program. Um, welcome. I hope you guys can see me. I'm sorry about the um, audio problems with the video, um, but, uh, you know, it will, uh, it will be available to you if you just search for Canatech Biosci Phylos Bioscience or something on YouTube. So, um, for now, real quick, I wanted to show you guys a little bit, um, a couple of the tools that you're going to get if you come to class. Um, one is uh, the interpreting loop. This helps you determine uh, what uh, the indica sativa ratio is. And when you open it, it helps you determine what the quality of cannabis is. If you open it again, the unacceptable characteristics. Opening it one more time tells you a little bit about terpenes. And then opening it again gets you right back to the front. So that's a really fun tool. And then uh, you'll also be able to get <clears throat> the weed wheel, which is uh, something that tells you the difference between sativas and uh, indicas on this really handy wheel and will kind of be a great tool if you're going out to dispensaries. Um, and then you'll also be getting this 42-page uh, guidebook here, which is a uh, full color, tells you all about the history of cannabis. Um, you know, we have a sociological view on it. We got... We got the geographical view on it. We got the biological view on it, the chemistry view on it. And of course, you know, the artistic view of it with uh, cannabis interpreting and the cannabis methodology.